So a little bit of a prelude to background. Um, there's this proposal, and 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 uh, and Stephanie was on here. Stephanie's part of this this DART proposal from the National Science Foundation, um, and and basically this stands for data analytics that are robust and trusted. And this is for the state of Arkansas. And it's a large grant. It's actually, it's, it's $24 million total. Now this is across the state of Arkansas for all the different universities. But it's, it's for, like I said, developing computational infrastructure. And when we're writing the grants, when we were working on this, um, we have different themes, cyber infrastructure, data curation, social awareness, social media, learning and prediction. And Liz is part of this as well. So, so Liz, as you know, is um, computer is part of the uh, computer science. Um, Liz, are you director of computer science at UAMR? Is that right? What I'm your uh, the chair of information science. Liz is the chair of information science. There you go. And so Liz is very aware of this and has been working with this from UALR. Um, and, and so the interesting thing here on the side is applications and, and we're supposed to engage in industry. And, and as you know, Walmart or Arkansas is a very strong industry, right? Walmart, J.B. Hunt, Tyson Food. And, and so if you look um, at, the, at the applications, you have transportation logistics. Well, this would be kind of J.B. Hunt, for example, the largest transportation company in the United States, one of the very, very big in this retail and e-commerce. Uh, this is Walmart and other things, right? Marketing and behavior. This is again, um, you know, and you think about Tyson Foods, the largest food manufacturer, you know, and, and they have genomics. It's like one of these things is different than the others. I mean, this is, you know, and, and it's really kind of weird. Why in the world would it? And, and so, so I, I want to put this in, I'm being a bit provocative, but I want you to think about that because it's like, why? Why, why genomics? And, and so in this, Grant here, we've got data curation as part of it. And, and so Stephanie and I, and Zeron and just joined, are, are part of this data curation. And, and so, but genomics is here and it's like, why is this? And, 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 and so we're part of this data curation, what we call data washing machines to biomedical data. Okay, so, so but still like, why would we need all this money for genomics? What does genomics have to do with computer science? Um, and, and so, this is a slide from, from a, um, a course that I'm teaching this semester, it's kind of a survey course on kind of an introduction to bioinformatics. And I love this slide. Um, so this is from um, Jeff Pummel, and he's from the Arkansas High Performance Computing Center up, up in, in, in uh, Fayetteville, in Northwest Arkansas. And basically, whoops, sorry, this thing is very sensitive. Sorry, sorry, let me go back to my, my somehow my, and this application, the keyboard doesn't work. There, okay. No, sorry. Stop that. This is like cats. All right. So, for in the past year, this is just in the year 2020, there was 2,314 exabytes of healthcare data. Now, this is, this includes mainly genomic sequencing, which we'll talk about in a minute. But so 2,300 exabytes is 2.3 zettabytes. That's 2.3 times 10 to the 21st bytes. That's this number down here, that many bytes of information. This is a lot of information. So one byte is here, 1,000 bytes is a kilobyte. This is a megabyte is a million bytes, right? And then for megabyte is gigabyte, a billion bytes, right? And then you have a terabyte, which is a lot. You know, you can buy like a four terabyte disk drive, right? Then you have a petabyte, which is really big. That's 10 to the 10 to the 12th, 10 to the 15th. And then you've got uh, from petabyte, then you have an exabyte, which is what this is, 10 to the 18th, which is a very, very big number. And then you have zettabytes. So this is a huge number. So just to write out two zettabytes, if you're to actually write on the fastest way that we can, just to write it to the disk. Now I'm talking about just just writing it if on you know just writing that data once on one drive, just writing it out would take several years. We generate this much data in one year, and how how in the world can you analyze this? And the other question is, what is this data? I mean, really, that much data? 
most of this data is actually genomics. And so, okay, so, well, that's nice, genomics, but, but what is genomics? And what is biological information? So now that's getting coming to the gist of this lecture. So if you look up in the Oxford English Dictionary, there, there's, you know, different people, bioinformatics has been around for, for many years and, and everyone kind of has their own definition of it. Um, so bioinformatics is defined as the science of information and information flow in biological systems, especially using computers and computational methods and genetics and genomics. And the thing I like about the OED is they'll say, well, when was the word first used? They try and find out and they tell you a little bit about the history of it. So it's first used in 1978 by Pauline Hockebeck in Utrecht, at the University of Utrecht. And in fact, I, one of her master's students did a project with me. And, and, and so I, I lived in Denmark for many years and Denmark and the Netherlands are fairly close. And anyway, I had one of her students. And, and um, so I, I first got into this in the late 90s. So, so by the time I got into it, this was, you know, 20 years or so after we've been formed. Um, but the interesting thing too, if you look down at the bottom, 2001, so this is more recent history, this is only 20 years ago, the hope was to make New York time, New York a leader in cutting edge fields like bioinformatics, in which computers are used to decipher genes and germs. So, so this has been around for a while. Now, what's happened is because the cost of sequencing has gotten so much cheaper, which we'll talk about that in another lecture, but we have much more information now to be able to, to, to analyze it. So, so biological information is different than there's other types of information. And so, so if you look at this picture here, this has got some lilies on here, but you see these reflections and these reflections are from the wall, right? There's information here and these, these, these are carvings that people made in, in this marble, right? And that's information, but that's, different than the information that stored the biological information. You go from one lily to two lilies and that's passed on from generation to generation. So biological information is basically, in a sense, genetics and genomics historically, right? And, and, and so viruses, as you, as you all know, viruses um, are very small piece. And basically all it is, is a piece of genetic material. In this case, in, in, is RNA, it can be RNA or DNA. And then it's got a coat around it. It's got a protein coat or, or lipid coat. And that, that's all it is. And so it's basically just a chemical. In a sense, a virus is like a rock. And it's not really living. Viruses aren't alive. They're just, they're just a set of chemicals. But these chemicals contain instructions. See, here's the information. This is, and, so, and so this information is the biological information. And so that's what we're going to be talking about. So just a little side on about viruses. Uh, this, th these guys are really, really efficient. You, you hear on the news all the time about COVID-19. And, and, but you know, so, so these are really small. And the question is, why is it so difficult to keep this virus from spreading, particularly if it's dead already, right? Like, well, what, what's the problem here? So these viruses are so small, billions can float around in tiny droplets in the air just from one cough. 100 million viral particles of coronavirus would fit on a pinhead, 100 million. And they're really, really small. And so if you're to take all the viruses that infect just bacteria, um, they, they would, they're, they're just an enormous number. So, so viruses are all over the place. They're more than, um, they weigh, if you're to weigh them, they would actually weigh more than everything else, which is kind of amazing. And so if you're to take all the viruses that infect bacteria and stretch them out, end to end, they would be 100 million light years, which is a thousand times longer than the Milky Way. So, so the point is that, that these guys, the, the genomic information is really, really abundant. And so when people talk about sequencing genomes, they're not going to run on genomes to sequence anytime soon. There's just an enormous amount of material there. So this lecture is kind of based on these uh, series of books, and there's more recently this this uh, the gene this this um, this book is now part of a series on PBS, and I meant to update this slide and include that, but but that's um, there's a a really nice series on PBS about this. But but so th there's a wonderful book if you can read French, uh, it's fantastic. Uh, and there's a pretty good this is an English translation. It's pretty good from 1973, um, called The Logic of Life. Okay, so, and then um, who wrote the Book of Life? 
Um, this is a really, really nice book about the history of genetic code. And then again, the inside story, DNA to RNA to protein. Um, and so anyway, so I mentioned this is on PBS. Okay. So like most science, you, um, you want to kind of know the history and it goes back to the Greeks. Mo most of our science was originally the Greeks for a while and then you have this jump. And so Aristotle back 350 BC divided, um, he was kind of the first biologist. And he said, you have plants, you have animals, you have minerals. These are the three forms of life. And, 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 and so, you know, you have these diatoms and these diatoms are kind of fun because they actually, they are a combination of minerals and plants and animals, which is kind of combined. But, but, but so today we really, we have still three categories when we actually now look at the history, how, how, these, how these things change over time. And what you see is three groups you have archaea here, which is kind of pink. You have bacteria and you have eukaryotes. And then here, and this is this is from our textbook, and this is actually exaggerated. This is smaller than this. It actually is a little bit bigger than it is in real life. But here you have plants and animals. And you can see on this scale, here's slime mold. And basically everything, the top part of this, all of this and most of this is microbial. That is things that's too small to see with your eyes. So the big stuff over here, from a from a genetics point of view, from a genomics point of view, they're all the same. Plants and animals, they're all kind of boring. And, and I often get into trouble saying that you know I'm a bit of a species because I say that uh, that bacteria are more highly evolved than, than than humans. But but if you think about it just in terms of dividing times, Vibrio cholera can divide every five minutes in your blood, and so you go from two to four to eight to sixteen to thirty two, and pretty soon. It, overwhelms the system and, and if you don't if you don't stop it basically you die but for every five minutes viral color can divide humans it takes much longer you know it takes 40 years to go from one elephant to two elephants if you think about it. so plants and animals they they evolve much they, they have fewer replication times so they may have time to optimize them okay so anyway so so this is kind of looking at kind of sorting life now gregor mental we jump from um from the greeks now to, to 1800 so so this is like you know 2000 years in the future and gregor mendel was a monk and and he basically studied pea plants and and he he's the one that came up he coined the word genes and genes from genesis and genes mean these somehow convey hereditary information he had no idea what it was but but this is kind of theoretical so there's these theoretical units that can make greens either genes that can make peas either yellow or green. And, and it was something, and, and, he, and by, by playing around with it, he could actually get these ratios. And, 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 and so something was going on, he knew that, but he had no idea what it was. And around, this is 1866. So a few years later, um, around the same time, they had known that there were the four bases, G, uh, G A, C, and T. Here are the four bases. Um, and this guy, Albert Kossel, got the Nobel Prize in 1910. And this is a, a Swedish stamp you're showing. So, so this guy got the Nobel Prize for knowing the four bases. Now at the time, they had no idea what they were. They just, we find these and we find them in cells and, and there are these chemicals that are called bases. Thomas Hunt Morgan in 1919 uh, was looking at chromosomes and, and, and he realized that, that, you know, he kind of postulated these things called genes that Mendel are called genes might actually be on these chromosomes. So now you have kind of a physical basis. And in fact, he wrote a book called The Physical Basis of Heredity. Um, and, and I have a copy of this. When I was a graduate student, one of the uh, departments got took it over by another department. They put all the books from the library out in the hall just to be thrown away. And, and, and they had this, I had a copy, got a copy of this book, 1919, Thomas Morgan uh, on, on the, uh, Physical basis of heredity. Very, very interesting book. So, so that's 1990. So this is 100 years ago. Um, and and so, you know, you could see these things. I had no idea what it was again. And and so shortly after that, another two scientists, Beetle and Town, basically proposed that one gene is an enzyme. Okay. So, well, what what 
what, what, what is an enzyme? So, so one gene is an enzyme. An enzyme is basically a catalyst that can make things go faster. So, so you, you have two chemical products and you're going from one to the other. And it could happen, but it would take a long time. And sometimes the catalyst will put it in the right shape and it can make it go much faster. And, and in a way, biology is all about catalysts and breaking things down and, and, and enzymes. And, and so, so the idea was that maybe a gene makes an enzyme. And, and then it turns out that they were right. It's a little more complicated than that. Life always is, but that was the general idea. Okay, so that's in the 1930s. Now, Oswald Avery in 1941, he, he had this book, he published this paper, which kind of revolutionized things. They had been trying to figure out what is a gene? Is it a protein or what is it? And he, he did this study. Um, and this is the very famous paper, 1943 is what it was received for publication. And, and um, this is in, in New York. And, and, and basically, he proposed that its DNA is a genetic material. What they had done is they had the, this uh, pneumococcal, uh, and it's a bacteria that could, could, could basically kill cells. And you could filter it out. And, and it turns out that there was some material that could still infect and kill the cells. And so what they would do is they said, they, they thought it was protein. They're sure it was protein. They're just gonna prove that they're right. And it turns out they cut up the protein and it could still infect the cells. So then they said, what could it be? Maybe it's a carbohydrate, got rid of all the carbohydrates, no. And eventually the only thing that was left was DNA. And they said the DNA must be the genetic material. Now, that was kind of at the time, it wasn't what people expected, a little bit counterintuitive, but you know, that, that was, so that was, that was going on in 1943. What also happened in 1943, actually three things happened in 1943. So one was they figured out it was DNA. The second thing is, is a physicist, this is at Trinity College in, in Ireland. Uh, so Erwin Schrodinger, you probably know, you guys have heard of Schrodinger's cat. Um, and so Schrodinger was a very famous physicist who worked in quantum mechanics and other things and very, very mathematical. Um, but he, he was German and this is 43 is in the middle of World, World War II. Germ and at that time, Ireland was neutral. Now Schrodinger was Jewish. If he went back to, to Germany, he would be killed. Um, and, and so he was, you know, he was kind of a guest lecturer at Trinity College. Um, and, and so he gave, he, he gave some talks there and he gave a couple of talks about physics and, and he wanted to give a talk about what is life. And uh, the local newspaper read an ad that said, this guy Schrodinger is going to give a talk. It's open to the general public. You're welcome to come, but you probably won't understand anything. It's going to be lots of equations and mathematics and physics. And, and it turns out that his talk was surprisingly simple. And his talk was all about the subject of this lecture, which is which is what is life. Now he's looking at what is the physical basis of heredity. And what he proposed, and the reason this is so important, this is the same, now you realize this is the same year, they realized DNA is a genetic material. Schrodinger didn't know that, but he proposed that biological information was digital. And so the information, the chromosome, they knew, they knew the chromosomes were somehow involved. And so, so, so he says that we think that a gene, maybe the whole chromosome fiber, is an aperiodic solid. Okay, so now what the hell, what, what is this an aperiodic solid? Well, okay, just ignore that A for a minute. A periodic solid is something that repeats and you can make crystal structures for it. So, so it, in terms of sequences, if you, if, if you have the, CAT repeated, CAT, CAT, CAT. That's periodic, right? So every three, you're, you're repeating yourself, right? Cat, 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 cat. Now, an aperiodic solid is something that doesn't repeat. And, and so what it is, is you have a, a random set of words or, or things that are not repeating. And so a random set of characters. And so, so he said, as an example, and I think this is a really, really important analogy that really took on. He said, think about Morse code. So Morse code, has only two characters, zeros and ones. And yet, you know, they're using Morse code in the 1940s to transmit lots of information. Newspaper articles can be transmitted in Morse, Morse code. You, you can transmit, it takes a bit of time to, to code it and decode it, but just using two bits of information, zeros and ones, you can basically transmit a lot of information. And, and if you think about it, and, and, and also the third thing that happened, I said three things happened in 43. The third thing was, they're building the first computer. 
and that was a binary computer based on zeros and ones. And 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 this is also part of, of World War II. But but the point is that that they can begin to store information now. Uh, now this now in computers, of course, is not biological. It's just stored information in general in zeros and ones. And so you have computer science really beginning to take off. So 1943, these all all three of these things happened, and this was uh, little, you know, 70 a little more than uh, yeah 75 years ago, 78 years ago, something like that. So um, it was a while back, um, and that was kind of the beginnings for where we are. So now we that was in 43. So 10 years later, 1953, there's Watson and Crick, and probably everyone's heard of Watson and Crick, you know. Um, and so this brings me to the favorite part of my lecture now. If it was, it, if we were there in class in person, I would actually pull out a bottle of Coca-Cola and say DNA is like Coca-Cola. And, and, and then I, and, and I love it. And it actually seems like this as well, because uh, well, you'll see here in a minute, but so I pour a bowl of Coke and I say, yeah, DNA is like Coca-Cola. Now, here is a little bit of a participation. Again, not as much if we're in person, but that's, that's, so what is the main ingredient in Coke? Can someone tell me? If you look at the list of ingredients, what's the main ingredient in Coke? Anyone? Is it sugar? Sugar, yeah. Nope, that's not the first ingredient. Water? Water, yes. And it turns out both, both Coke and DNA, DNA is really hydrated and water is really, really important. So the second ingredient, people have already said, what is it? Second ingredient is? That one's sugar. Sugar, yes. So, so Coke contains sucrose sugar, at least in some places it does. It depends on where you are, I guess. But, but uh, historically, it contains sucrose. And DNA contains deoxyribose, which is just a sugar. Now, a sugar is written in chemistry, we write it as C in parentheses H2O-N. It's a carbohydrate. So for every one carbon, you have an H2O. That's the way of thinking about it, right? So glucose, the common sugar is C6, right? C6, and then you have H2O, you have six of those. So, so you can think of one carbon and six waters. So, so my point is, to bring this up, is sugar is really, really soluble in water. And as you guys know, um, so this isn't, this isn't a Coke bottle, this is, this is just a, a water bottle, but, but, but if, if you were to actually take a Coke and extract the sugar, it's like more than half. If you were to have just granular sugar fill it up, it's just an enormous amount of sugar that sugar is really, really soluble in water, okay? And, and, and it turns out that, 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 that the, the backbone for DNA is sugar, and that's how it can, can be solubilized in the cell. Now, um, the next ingredient, anyone want to guess? Caffeine. It's, it's there. Well, we're coming to that, but not yet. What, what's, what's, what's another ingredient? It's more, so the, these are the most two, and then the, the next one, it depends, of course, on, on and I'm, I'm not sure in Coke, it's actually the third ingredient, but it's another ingredient that's important for this talk, and it's, and it's not caffeine. What, what, what do you think? In sugar, or in uh, Coke, what else is in Coke? It's related to biology, if you think about it, what's in DNA? So DNA, it's got water, it's got a sugar. Lost fork acid phosphoric acid right and so in fact in in coke and 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 when i was growing up we used to have uh i still remember a tractor and the battery had gone out and and, and my my grandfather came and poured a pepsi over the the battery and you know the acid all ate it up and got it all fixed up and, and with a bit of, of brushing and stuff we managed to get it working again so there's, and I was impressed as a kid. I, was like, I had no idea. <laughs> and so, so Coke has, has uh, phosphoric acid in it. They, they say it's making it addicting. I, I don't know, but, but anyway, you, you do have, and if you were to actually look at Coke and, and again, you hold it up, you would have a little bit of powder in the bottom. Now you'd have a lot of sugar and a little bit of powder, which represents a phosphate. So that's there. In DNA, you have your phosphate backbone. And that's also, you know, somewhat soluble in water. Okay. Now, the next ingredient, and people have said this several times, so, so this is the, 
the, the last one for this in Coke. What, what else is important in Coke, which gives you your kick, so to speak? No, you guys are quiet. You've already said this before. The caffeine. Caffeine, right? Okay. So caffeine's really important. And, and you know, you can get jolt. Do you remember? Do, I don't know if any of you guys remember jolt or not, but the, you could buy extra caffeine, right? Extra high caffeine. But but it turns out that you can't put that much caffeine. And so if you were to, to take, you know, a Coke and you were to extract all the caffeine and look, it, there'd just be a few little flakes at the very bottom, just a teeny tiny bit. There's not much at all. And it turns out the caffeine is not really very soluble, which is probably good because we'd otherwise it'd be dead from, from too much caffeine, right? But it turns out that, that caffeine, you, and this is where, hmm, so I have to kind of improvise. Usually I have, uh, when I'm giving lectures, I usually have under the desk, I have some Swiss chocolate bars, which I can hold and use. And, and um, so this morning I just had some breakfast here, so I have Swiss chocolate bars, but you can think of something like this. Like, so, so the caffeine is a flat plane of molecule. It's got two rings, okay? And, and these are conjugated high systems. And so the, it, if you look at it chemically, the structure is very flat. And it's, and it's got a width to it but, it, but it's very flat. And it turns out it's very hydrophobic. So hydro is water, phobic is fear, right? It hates water. And so you try to put caffeine in solution and it comes back out. And, and so, like I said, there's not that much. And it turns out that, 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 that uh, some of these, you know, Coke products where they have lots of caffeine, it's actually super saturated. It, it, it's, that stuff really won't stay in very long. It'll, it'll precipitate out. And, and so, you try and put it in and it comes back out. You try and put it in and it comes back out. So sometimes though, if you mix it and you warm it up a bit and you have another one, they'll stack on top of each other. And they like that stacking interaction really helps a lot and they can twist so because they really, they, they hate water, they twist on top of each other. And it turns out that if you have caffeine, just caffeine and you put it in solution, it forms a helix on its own because it hates water and, it's trying to, and, 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 and it twists a little bit and it, occurs, and it forms a helix. And so, in DNA, now, what is a base analog for caffeine? So caffeine is actually, it's, it's a weak carcinogen because it can actually be incorporated in DNA. So how does that happen? What, what, what does caffeine look like in terms of what, what's missing now in the DNA? The nitrogenous bases. The bases, yes. And so caffeine, it turns out, looks a whole lot like adenine. In fact, caffeine in the cells, it looks a lot like something called cyclic AMP, which is adenosine monophosphate. So you, the, the, you got your phosphate in the background. And, 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 and the way that the, the shape, it's again, this flat planar surface. And it's, it's got this conjugate positive. And it, it basically, it's a base analog for adenine. So it can get, it can get substituted in the DNA so it turns out that caffeine, um, yeah, it can be substituted. Now, the reason I'm saying all this is, is, is that, that it turns out that the bases are what's really important in DNA. The, the information is here, the order of these bases. And these bases, they spontaneously, they can stack on top of each other and form a helix on their own. So the structure of the helix, the phosphate backbone sticks it together, and you have the sugars on the outside, because remember, the bases are not very soluble in water. So you need that, you need the sugars to help solubilize it. So from a chemical point of view, that this base is now um, here, the, the bases in DNA will spontaneously stack on top of each other and form a helix, okay? And, and, and so you have your phosphates here, you have your base, and, and you, you, you have your phosphate and your sugar and a base, and now you have your nucleotide, this is kind of symbolically. And so you have your DNA and see, see the, notice that these are taller. So the guanine and adenine, these are called purines and they have two rings. And thymine and cytosine only have one ring. They're, they're a little bit shorter. So, so if you see, this goes longer, shorter. So it's, there's a bit of difference here in, in, the, in the size of these. And A binds with T and C binds with G. And it's such that the width of the helix is the same now because you've always got a purine binding with a pyrimidine. And so here is now the double helix. And this is, again is kind of an, an, an average form. And so here you have, uh, 
this again, this is an average, and 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 it turns out that on average it's around 34 degrees. But really, that that twisting between the bases can vary between 27 degrees and 40 degrees. It depends on really what it is. It can unwind, and and it's very dependent on the sequence. And so it turns out that, that the order of the bases determines the structure. And that's the most important thing that the take home lesson is that the order of the bases. Now, I don't know whether anyone in here can read this. So, this you can read DNA code. Can anyone read this? Anyone know what this means? So, I, I gave this workshop, um, and actually I've, I've done this now about a dozen times in Thailand and, and Bangkok, uh, and, 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 and they had this sign, and, and the sign basically says in Thai, don't bring any food or drink into the room. That, that's what the sign says, okay? Now, that information in the sign, that information is the order of the letters determines the words, and then the words determine the meaning. And so the DNA code in that sense is like the order, just so the order of the bases, G, A, C, G, T, A, that order determines the information. And, and so, so in the case of DNA, we write a sequence like this, G's, A's, T's, there's only four bases, G's, A's, T's, and C's, and it looks like this, but remember, DNA is double-stranded. And, and so when we write it, we're saying five prime to three prime, there's a directionality to it, it goes this way. And then you have the other strand going the other way. So you have DNA, and DNA, then you make a copy of it, it gets transcribed into RNA. Now, RNA is the same except the base, instead of a deoxyribose, it's a ribose sugar. And remember, viruses, some viruses are RNA viruses. So, so you, you make a copy of the RNA, and everywhere there's a T, you now have a U. So this went G A T C A up here. This is five prime, three prime, the top one. Now you're making a copy that goes G A U C U, and so the T's replace the U. But apart from that, I mean, it, it, it's the same. You know, it's the same sequence. It's pretty easy to figure out. There's some pretty simple rules there. Just every time there's a T, replace it with the U, and this gets translated then into the protein. And here's a protein. The proteins are made of amino acids, and there are 20 different amino acids. Okay, so this DNA sequence can be transcribed into a messenger RNA. Now the messenger RNA, how do you know where this protein goes? It turns out that there is, it's read in threes, and there's a, something called a start here, which tells it, okay, this methionine, so these three code for methionine, these three code for proline, these three code for methionine. So you can read it in terms of triplet. So you have the, the, the base code, okay? So, so you have, the DNA makes a copy of RNA. This is called transcription. And the messenger RNA then gets translated into protein. Because now, so you, you need to a, a, look this up. There's something called the genetic code. And so there are 64 possibility, possible triplets, and you only have 20 amino acids. So there's some redundancy in there. And, and, and it took a while to figure this out. And, and so back in the 1960s, or well, late 50s, early 60s, they knew that DNA was a genetic material, but they also knew that DNA made protein somehow, or at least that was kind of the general idea. So this was called the sequence hypothesis. And, 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 and they didn't know, but they, they said, okay, we, we think that somehow the amino acid sequence of proteins comes from DNA and RNA. And they actually then eventually they showed, yes, that's, that's true, that, that, that is what happens. So, but from this came what's called the central dogma. And so the central dogma is that the information flows to the proteins. And once it flows from the DNA, RNA to protein, it can't flow back. And, and, and so this is kind of symbolized here. So, so you have DNA. Now you can make copies of DNA. And you can go from DNA to RNA. Remember, this is transcription. And it turns out you can do something called reverse transcriptase, where you can go from RNA back to DNA, OK? So, so you can go from DNA to RNA back to DNA, fine. And you can go from RNA, you can make copies of, of, of RNA itself. So, so this is RNA viruses do this, right? So, so you could do all of this, but and then you go from RNA to protein, 
Now, what the central dogma says is you can't very easily, it's, it's almost impossible, you can't go from protein back to RNA. I mean, you can guess, but because the genetic code is redundant and you have 64 possibilities, and, and, and there's some other reasons as well, I'll, I'll talk about maybe we'll, we'll see, but, but there's things called editing and, and, and it's, it's just a nightmare. It's, it, biology is really messy and complicated, but this is kind of the general idea. So, so if you have all the DNA gets transcribed, so all the DNA is called the genome, the O means all, so this is all the genes, right? All of the DNA is a genome. It gets transcribed to RNA. So all the, all the stuff that gets transcribed, you call it the transcriptome. This is all the stuff that gets transcribed. And then all the stuff that gets transcribed, some of this gets translated into protein. And so this transcriptome makes a proteome. So now the flow of information goes from your genome to your transcriptome to the proteome. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, that, this is what biology is all about. So in the case of the coronavirus, you know, this has been in the news, um, here's your coronavirus and here's your RNA genome. And, and, and this RNA, this is the information. Now, how does this make protein? So here it's kind of mapped out where the proteins are encoded by the RNA. But you know, the 1950s, they're trying to figure this out. And so what they did is, is they, had, they had some DNA sequences and they had some protein sequences and they're trying to figure out, okay, how does it go between the DNA and the protein? And, and so this guy, does anybody know who this is? I, I, mean, I mean, Liz might know, but do, does anyone recognize this person? Liz, do you know who this guy is? I was gonna just do a wild guess. Is that Turing? No, that's not Turing. No, this, this is in the US. Uh, this is von Neumann. So, so this, this is with a, a computer called the Maniac. It was a huge, huge computer. This is probably like in the 1950s. And, and this is a really big, you know, it, you ready for this? It, it could handle 500 bytes of information. <laughs> Not even a kilobyte, but, but you know, they're, they're, this is back in the early days of processing. But, but in the 1950s and 1960s, in computer science, now they're starting to talk about information. And of course, in the computer science information, they're thinking digital information and they're thinking zeros and ones, that kind of binary information. And so it's, it's logical to think of the DNA sequence as information, because now instead of zeros and ones, you have uh, four bits, or I'm sorry, two bits of information. You've got you can ask two questions. Is it a purine? Yes or no. And then is it an A or T? And, and, and by those two questions, you can figure out which the form, which base it is. So, so you only need two bits of information to get four possibilities, G, A, T, C. So um, people were thinking, okay, we, this is all solved. We, we understand it. So, so they're going to use computers to figure out how, what is the genetic code? Because there's 64 possibilities right? And you have 20, 20 amino acids. And it turns out that, that they, they had all these, they had all the DNA sequences, they had the protein sequence, and they're trying to go back and forth between them. And they're in all these computer programs. And can anyone tell me, did it work? Does anyone know? Know what happened? It turns out it wasn't the computer scientists that solved this. It was experimentalists. What they did is they made AAAA. And they said, oh, look, this makes uh, phenylalanine. So it must be that the three A's make phenylalanine, and it's just right. Re re and then they would make UUU and, and GGG and CCC, and then they would go GA, GA, GA. And now if you look at the three sets, you can figure out, you can look and see what, what amino acid, and you're getting alternating amino acids. And so by kind of process of elimination, by doing experiments, they solve the genetic code. The computer scientists said, oh, we know because it's information science, we can solve it. Well, no, they, they didn't. But somehow this got missed in a lot of the textbooks. And so people still think that the DNA sequence is no different than a Boolean zero one. And, 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 and you, you hear people like Bill Gates say, well, the DNA is the most complicated computer program ever written. And it's kind of maybe partly true. And, and so, so this has been maybe 10, 15 years ago. So um, I'm the youngest of five and and my, my family, um, I grew up, uh, up in Springdale and, and, and we used to joke that they're all, you know, there were 20,000 people and out of the 20,000 people, 
19,998 all believe the world was created 4,004 BC, September 23rd, 10 o'clock in the morning is a Thursday. And the only two that didn't can't deny it. And <laughs> we both wound up leaving. My, my, my brother, he's really worried. He knows that I'm a scientist and most scientists are kind of, you know, tend towards atheist and, you know, having all these things. And so he sent me this book and, and you know, he loves me. He doesn't want me to burn in hell. And, 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 I, and I appreciate that. I, I understand that. But so, so here's and the, the title of the book is Signature in the Cell. And the subtitle is DNA and the Evidence for Intelligent Design. And, and my brother knew I worked with DNA. And, and so, so here, here's a DNA helix, and here's your code, you can see GATC. And then the shadows under it is a circuit board. And the idea is that the DNA encodes all this information for how to make the circuit board. And that's kind of true, maybe. And, and so th there's this whole group, and, and, and this guy that wrote this book, Stephen Meyer, it turns out that his book was 500 pages long. And Darwin's Origin of Species was 500 pages long. And he makes this long argument. And Darwin made an argument. So his book is the same as Darwin's Origin of Species, or at least this is what my brother was telling me. I'm like, okay, well, I'll read it and see. And, and, and so these guys, what, what they do is it's, it's all about information. We're talking about sequences as information. And so, 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 you know, this is a really complicated code. So the question is, who wrote it? Who is, and, 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 and it couldn't have happened on its own. So it turns out it was obviously evidence for intelligent design. You had to have uh, an intelligent design. And, and I call this a one dimensional view of biological information. Okay, so, so what, what I mean by that? So, so, so I'll come back in, in a minute to think about this, but, but it is true, DNA sequences contain information and the DNA sequence does code for amino acids. Yes, absolutely, that's true, they're, they're right. Now, but the DNA sequence can also code for RNA sequences that don't get translated, okay? And the DNA sequence can code for stable RNAs, tRNAs, ribosomal RNAs, small nuclear RNAs, telomerase RNAs. Telomerase RNAs are the things at the end of the chromosomes that kind of hold them together. It can also code for protein binding sites. It can code for architectural. Now, what is this architectural information? So, so it turns out that for many years, I worked on something called DNA curvature, and you can actually, on the, on, on the computer, take a DNA sequence and predict what it's going to look like in 3D, and some sequences are curved, have natural curvature to it. And, and that's important for protein binding sites and other things. And for binding, these, these are proteins where it wraps around, because the DNA, I, I really haven't talked about this, I'll talk about this at some later, but DNA is compact about 7,000 fold in bacteria. It's really, really crunched up there. And you need proteins to help crunch that up. In, in humans, a lot of the DNA gets permanently crunched, this, uh, is, is kind of, you know, wrapped up. In bacteria, it's more dynamic, but, but the level is about the same. You have roughly 7,000 fold compactus. So if you're to stretch it out, it's really long. So if you take DNA from one cell in a human, a person, you to take one cell, stretch out the DNA, it's two meters long. It's almost as tall as, as you are up and down. From one cell, just the DNA from one cell. And so the nucleosomes are, are, are responsible for wrapping that up. So, so, so there's a lot of information there in terms of architectural information. Now there's also structural stability information. So, so some sequences are more flexible, some can open up, they can bind. And so there's a lot of this kind of information. So you have transcription initiation, you have origins of replication where you make copies. You can also have mutational hotspots. So some parts of the chromosome can mutate it higher. So in short, you have all these different types of things. And so really what's going on here, this information isn't just coding for proteins. Yes, it can. But more importantly, the information is actually forming all these different structures. And so DNA can be curved, it can be flexible, it can be left-handed, it can open up, it can form cruciforms, it can form hairpins, it can form folded slip structure, slip strand structure. It can be parallel, sometimes it can be anti-parallel. It can form a quadruplex, like the chromosome, so four-stranded DNA, three-stranded DNA. So it can do all these different things. And does it do this in the cell? Well, yes, it does. It turns out that it's doing a lot of different dynamic things. So, 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 so this is what I call a three-dimensional view of biological information. So it's not that I think that these guys, you know, it's not because I'm opposed to them saying, well, you know, believing in God, right? I don't care. They, they can believe in God. They want that's fine. But they're trying to say we have scientific evidence. We can prove that God exists because it had to be intelligent designer because, because DNA sequence codes for proteins and you had to have an intelligent designer. I'm like, well, 
they missed a big part of this is what's called an urban legend. This is in, in society all around us. So I don't blame them per se, but this is just an example. And, and I probably offended people on, by, by bringing this tone design up, but, but it's, it's, it's an example of what's abundant in our society that people really think DNA is just codes for proteins. Well, it does code for proteins, but it does a lot more as well. And in fact, in humans, only 1% of the DNA codes for proteins, 1%. And so it does a lot more than just code for proteins. And, and, and the structural, the three-dimensional structure is the information. So that's DNA. Now, RNA, of course, RNA can make proteins. Yes, it does. RNA can also say where these proteins are going to be made. So it's kind of like a little postal code or zip code where it says, and so you have a cell. And before the cells, you know, you have like a very early stage oocyte or something you have the RNAs being made and there's a little thing on it that, that says, put this RNA over here, now this protein's made this part, this protein's made over here and this protein. So you have localization signals. You also have stability signals. Some RNAs, normally the, the average life, people talk about the, these, these vaccines. My, my brother, Steve, uh, was um, saying, oh, this, this Pfizer vaccine, you know, that, that it, it's just an RNA vaccine, right? And, and you know, is this going to change my DNA and stuff? And I kind of laughed at him. I said, it only lasts just a couple of minutes. That's why they have to keep it at minus 70. RNA is not very stable at all. RNA, the average half-life for RNA is about two minutes. And then it's gone. And so with people that work with RNA, they have to be really, really careful because RNA is just, just not, not that stable. Now, some RNAs can last a long time. Some RNAs can last several hours. And, and, and it depends on, so the, the structures can determine stability signals. There, there's ways you can do that from, from the point of view. They can also encode splice sites. So, so you have RNA splicing. So this piece of RNA gets spliced into that piece and put it together. They also can be edited, which is a real pain in the butt from, from, from a computational point of view, because you have your DNA sequence, you can predict the RNA sequence, but it turns out that when it gets made RNA, they make some changes. It's like, no, don't do that, please. It's a real pain in the butt. So you can have all of these different things going on. Now that's just looking for proteins. Now you can also have stable RNAs, transfer RNAs. And, 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 and so you have one tRNA uh, for each codon and you have 60 codons, 64 codons. And so it's more or less the same in all living organisms, kind of. It's a little bit different in mitochondria. There's maybe, depending on who you talk to, there's probably about 40 or 50 different genetic codes, um, but most organisms use more or less the same, um, kind of keep your fingers crossed, but, 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 but so generally the, 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 the same genetic code. Uh, ribosomal RNAs, these are a mixture of RNA and proteins that form very stable structure for, for, for synthesizing proteins. And then you have other DNA RNA complexes. And, and so this is just looking at an RNA molecule here. This kind of looks like a little person or something, but you can see that the base is here. It, it folds back on itself. This is RNA, RNA is single stranded RNA, but it sees double stranded in these places that can fold this particular structure. So the idea is again, the sequences encode a particular structure, and that structure determines what it does. So um, proteins can be information. Uh, but, but we already kind of knew this, and remember originally they thought the genetic material was proteins. And so proteins can basically be active sites for enzymes, they can, they can make structural roles, they can do ions and channels and pumps, and proteins do all kinds of things. I mean, proteins are kind of the workhorse in biology, right? And so this is a picture now, this is kind of a, it's called a ribbon structure. So, so here's part of a protein, and this is an alpha helix, a protein helix, and then it has a turn, another helix. So this is a helix turn helix motif is called. And this binds DNA. This is a part of the beta sheet up here. And, and you see, here's a piece of DNA here. And this is actually not that much. It's like 100 bases of DNA. And, and the protein binds it and it bends it 180 degrees. And so this is kind of what proteins do. Proteins, uh, they basically do all kinds of things because they have all kinds of shapes. And so you, you have alpha helices and beta sheets, and, and you have all kinds of kinases with phosphates, GTBase, oxaloreductase. You have all kinds of different proteins when they have different structures. So the summary is sequences make structures and those structures determine the function. And these sequences could be DNA sequences, they form structures, RNA sequences form structures, protein sequences form structures, and those structures determine the function. So that's kind of 
where I'm at. Okay. And so now I have some questions for you and then I'll let you ask me some questions. So this was taken yesterday. This is in our backyard. This is a plum tree. So there's some kind of, yeah, this is kind of fun. So here is a sequence and I want to know what information is in this sequence and related. How can you tell? Can anyone have any idea? Here's a sequence. What is it? How would you find out? Hey, Lee, I know you're not shy. You've probably seen this before. Is this from the Tata Box, like, uh, sequence, like when they use the software Tata Box? I don't know what Tata Box is, but Tata Box, we look where you're finding where, at least I think, that what the Tata Box is, is upstream. It's called minus 10, minus 35, where you're, uh, this is where your RNA polymerase is going to bind and open up the helix to make transcribe it, to make a copy messenger RNA. I would just blast this. <laughs> Good. Yes, absolutely. Yes, right. yeah, yeah, blast. So, Andrew, you're absolutely right. Just blast it. And you guys, and, and, and we'll post, I'll give this to Liz and she'll post it. And you can do that. And you can blast it and tell me what it is. So, when was blast written? What year? 20, 2013. Is it 13? Try again. It's one of the most cited papers, by the way. 1985. Oh. 1985. It's a fantastic program. It's really great. It still works kind of. Now, if you're to, to blast this against everything in NR, that what's called, so all of GenBank, all right? How long would it take? Everything against, everything is in the database. You, you want to say, you know, that, that's what you're going to do, right? Any idea how long it take? Maybe uh, a minute or two. Depends how many people are using it also. Yeah, but you have to listen to what my question is. Now I want to blast it against everything that's in the database. Probably hours. Do you remember me talking about how much was there before? 10 to 21? That's a lot of bases. How long is it going to take to search through that? So it turns out it takes several years. And, and so you don't do that. What they do is they have approximations they've made, done, they, they, they have ways of speeding things up. They have all kinds of tricks they can do, but you're not looking against everything. You probably don't want to. You couldn't because it doesn't scale very well. This is written in 1985 and things were a lot simpler back then and you could do some fairly simple searches, right? But now all of a sudden the world's a lot more complicated. Something to think about. So, so I'm curious who is, 1985, probably some of you weren't born in 1985, right? <laughs> just, just to think about. So, so um, yes, uh, blast absolutely. That's how you do it. But you just need to be aware that that um, it's not quite as, as yeah. <laughs> okay. And so, so the other is more kind of a philosophical question. But, but is DNA sequence really like a language? In other words, can you take a DNA sequence and translate it like you would a textbook and put it in different languages and, and then you'd have all the meaning? What do you guys think? No, um, maybe just because like there's like introns and exons and you have to like sort it out. Well, and, 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 so, and so how do introns and exons, now, you, now what you're doing is see, you're kind of skipping ahead you're thinking, DNA sequence, you're thinking of RNA sequence, right? The, the DNA encodes an RNA and that RNA gets spliced. Introns and exons are put at the RNA level, not DNA. Right? But you're right, those introns and exons, you have introns and exons boundaries. How are the, it turns out, how does it recognize that? It recognizes structures. Right? So what's happening is that the sequences form structures, and you can have different sequences forming the same structures. So you kind of need to learn all that. So it's not just a real simple linguistic. It's not, it's not just one dimensional. That is, you have your letters, G, S, and that's the information. It's th those letters actually encode, if you will, the information in those is the structures they form. And those structures then determine the function. So the biological information 
is in structures, not just sequence.